All right, so in Hebrews, what we've been seeing, and we saw it really clearly in chapter 1, and we continue to see it in the chapter 2, and we continue to see it really throughout the entire letter, uh, we've seen that Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. He's the exact representation of the Father. He is the righteous king and the divine son. He's the perfect sacrifice for our sin. There is no better way. There is no better way. This wasn't written into my message. But yesterday, I was in the parking lot of Lowe's, and someone was trying to say there was a better way. And I got out of my van to look at vinyl flooring, and there was a Mormon. And he was talking to this nice lady. He called her over, and I immediately knew what was going on, and I headed right there. And my wife says, Steve, don't. <laughs> Let's just go look at flooring. I said, I'll be right there. I like, completely ignored her. I'll be right there. She's like, I'm going to go look at the flooring. Said, that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to take care of this. And I said uh, something along the lines of, so... Uh, I see you're culting here in the Lowe's parking lot. By the way, uh, this is, this is, he's a Mormon. This is a cult. And, uh, and she's like, oh, you're Mormon? I have a book of Mormon in my, in my library. And I, I said, yeah, I, I want to find, I want to, I want to let you know something interesting about that book of Mormon. You know, with the, Bible, with the Bible, I said, do you believe the Bible is sufficient for, you know, life and godliness, that it's everything we need and for life and godliness? And I said, well, that's the gospel. No, 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 I... You know, with the Book of Mormon and dot, 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 dot. And I said, hey, well, let me tell you something about the Book of Mormon. The Bible has over 5,850 manuscripts that we have today, dating as early as the second century. We have a Book of Mormon that comes from like the 19th century, and we don't even have the copy that came down from heaven in gold plates that was buried somewhere in upstate New York that no one ever saw. You know, so, so we have a 19th century document we don't even have one manuscript of, and we have 5,850 manuscripts of the New Testament. What's that tell you? And I said, this is, it's a cult. You know, oh, oh, they're, 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 oh, they're, so they're Mormons? And I said, well, well, yeah, but they don't like to be called that. They like to be called Latter-day Saints, but the FLDS church and the, is a cult and the LDS church is a cult. He wasn't happy. And the conversation ended with something like, have fun culting and me walking away. I'm sorry. Roxanne's like, she says, it's just, uh, Steve, um, you know, that's probably not the, 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 and I said, listen, I know that's not the way to win this guy, but he's not trying to be one. He's trying to deceive people into his false way, some other way. Well, and it's another way, by the way. It's a completely other way. It's, it's, it's another way where the founder of the cult says, the great secret is that God was once a man like unto you, like unto one of you. That is the great secret. You know, so God became God. Of course, he denied that, but that's what Joseph Smith said. And it's written down, okay? So it's, you know, it is what it is. It's a different way. It's a different God. It's a different Jesus. It's a God who became God. It's a Jesus who was born of Father God and Mother God. It's a whole different situation. It's not even the same. It's not even close. Jesus married to Mary Magdalene and had children and all this stuff. It's just, it's a cult. There are a lot of people that follow a different way. Jesus is the only way. The Hebrews are, the Hebrews are tempted, in context, what we see throughout this letter is that the Hebrews are tempted to walk away from that only way. They're tempted to walk away from, they're in danger of drifting away from him, and that would be, disastrous to return to the Jewish sacrificial system when that system has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It would be disastrous because one day Jesus will come back and we'll all answer to him. Jesus suffered and died for us. And so again, it would be catastrophic to turn away from that one way. Jesus even says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me in John 14, 6. He is the only way and to fall away from him would be damnable. It would, see, it would show that you never really were a genuine Christian in the first place. 
I mean, look what Jesus' suffering and death accomplished for us. We're going to see that in this passage. In, in this passage, we see one of the first things we see is that Jesus' death renders Satan powerless over believers. So kind of get that, that point in your mind. Jesus' death renders Satan powerless over believers. And we actually see that here in this passage. Look at Hebrews 2.14. Now, now listen, before, before we... I just, I just want you to know, I know... If you're, if, you're, if you're one of those guys who really studies the text and you're like, I'm not sure the chapter begins in verse 14. I mean, the paragraph begins in verse 14. I know that. I believe that the paragraph begins in verse 10 and ends in verse 18. I believe that. I just couldn't get through it all in, last, in one week. So I really had to kind of split this up into two weeks. So this is really kind of part two, almost kind of like part two of what we looked at last week. I get it. So if you're paying really close attention, you know we're kind of already in this paragraph. Therefore, it doesn't open a paragraph. Okay, T typically. I mean, it's, it's, it's a continuation of, of a previous thought about, about Jesus' suffering. Anyway, we're seeing Jesus', Jesus death rendering Satan powerless over believers in verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, who are the children? Believers, believers. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. That is, he also shared in flesh and blood. He likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And so the, the, the first point you're really seeing here, the first idea that you're really seeing here is that Jesus himself shared in flesh and blood. He partook of the same. It was necessary for Jesus to share in flesh and blood. Jesus shared a common nature with mankind. He took on an additional nature. It's not that he stopped becoming divine. It's not that he, he, he left his divinity in another place and then became man. It's, it's that he took on an additional form of man. He took on humanity. That's why doctrinal statements, you look for language like fully God and fully man. It's not half half God and half man. He's fully God and fully man. He took on an additional nature. He experienced the same flesh that we experience. He experienced hunger. I don't like feeling hungry. You like feeling, Jesus would never have had to feel, he would understand what it was. God created hunger, right? But he experienced hunger in the flesh. He understands and experienced what it means to be tired. He experienced pain and sickness he experienced all that it is to be human. And, and we see that general idea written in the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh. That Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made in the beginning of this chapter. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His Glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see his humanity, we see his glory, even just a few verses later in that, in that gospel. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God. This is the word, this is Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. But here we see that Jesus humbled himself and entered into human flesh. He shared in flesh and blood. But he did that for a reason. And we actually see, we actually see like, uh, uh, like you could call it a purpose. You could call it a result. I mean, I always struggled. You know, one thing, we would do something called, uh, in, in, I think we did it in Bible college, but we've really focused heavy on it and se heavily on it in seminary. Something called, have you ever heard the term discourse analysis? So you take a passage and you analyze like what type of clause everything is. So this is a main verb. This is, a, this is a purpose clause. This is a result clause. This is grounds or the reason for a statement. So you're, you're, you're I actually do that all the time by accident. It's like, it's like nature that I do it now. But here I'm looking at this and I always get, I always, I always get a little messed up in my head. Is this the purpose for something or is it just the result of it? And I always, so what I would always do is, instead of putting purpose or result, I always wrote purpose typed, purpose slash result, 
and I never got it wrong. He always, you know, the, the, the professors always marked it right because I, 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 I can never distinguish whether it's purpose or result because they're so closely, you know, the reason why he did this was this, but that's also the result, you know what I mean? So you can see the, well, that's what we're seeing here. So, so he takes on human flesh and there is a purpose. There is a result for why he took on human flesh. And that is the, the main point of this part of the message that, or so that, through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He took on human flesh so that he could suffer. He lived a perfect life, became the perfect offering for sin, died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin, and his suffering and death ultimately rendered Satan powerless. Now we know that man is separated from God. We know there's nothing we could do to save ourselves. There's no amount of works, no amount of goodness, anything like that, that we can do to save ourselves and to, to earn God's favor. We, we are, again, children of wrath by nature and, and damned by nature. Every time I write that word in a sermon, it's underlined as a curse word. <laughs> it's like, please change this offensive language it tells me, and I'm like, no, because that's what the Bible actually says. We are damned. But Jesus came to reverse that situation for us so that we would, we would be taken out of the world and out of damnation and placed into the family of God and given life. And so Satan no longer has a foothold over us over believers, over genuine believers. He no longer has a means of accusing us unto damnation. He no longer has authority over us. Our sins have been completely paid for at the cross. So it's not that Jesus died on the cross and now I have to kind of like, you know, I know, but I've got to be a good person and I've got to get baptized and I've got to take communion and I've got to so on and so forth. And then if I put all those works together, then hopefully that's enough to add on to what Jesus did and I get to heaven. That's not the gospel. That's a false gospel. It's a false gospel. By the way, the Mormons hold something like that. And marriage is, in, is, a, is a big part of that, of that false gospel they hold to. The Jehovah's Witness hold to a false gospel. Mainline denominationals hold to a false gospel. The Roman Catholic Church holds to a false gospel. But the one true gospel is that our sins have been paid for completely at the cross. And that when he comes in flesh and blood and dies on the cross, he renders Satan powerless over us. And Satan is the one who had the power of death, you see here. He rendered powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He gained that authority when man fell. He, we, that goes back to the garden. Death is a result of sin. One guy says this, he says, death is the worst enemy of man. And Satan is the one through whom death came. He's the one who tempted Eve. But for the believer, Satan has no real power, not in eternity, and should have no real power over our lives. We are now God's children and we are destined for everlasting life. Death has now lost its sting, according to what Paul writes to the very weak uh, Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and following here. He says, but when this perishable, that is my mortal flesh, will have put on the imperishable, that is, we're talking about everlasting life here and, and receiving my resurrected, glorified body, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? Right? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the last day, Satan is destroyed. Anyone, anyone remember what happens to Satan? Anyone? He is, he's thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and we find that Where? in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. And then he's released for a little while. And then what happens to him? What's that? He's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
And we find that in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, uh, verses 7 through 10, and then 11 through 15. Jesus' death renders Satan powerless over believers. And we see that pretty clearly here in verse 14. Jesus' death sets believers free from the penalty of sin. So Jesus' death renders Satan powerless over believers. He has no authority over us. His death renders, he sets us free from the penalty of sin. Now I'm going to go back and read verse 14 again. So so you can kind of read verse 14 through what we just talked about, through that lens of understanding, and then see that second point. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself, that's believers, uh, believers are children, not us. That doesn't, not every single person is a child of God. Some of us are by nature children of wrath and still of our father, the devil. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same flesh and blood. That through death, through his death on the cross, one, because you have your, your purpose result, One, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is Satan. And two, might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus' death sets us free from damnation. One guy writes this, he says, human beings are slaves paralyzed by the fear of death. That makes sense because death is inescapable. It's coming for all of us. The old statement that I make in almost every funeral that I, that I preach a sermon at, I say, there's only, some, someone said, I don't know who said it, but there's only two things you can be sure of in life. And that is what? Death and taxes, <laughs> Death and taxes. One guy writes, death is no respecter of persons. It's the great leveler. So no matter how great you think you are on this earth, or no matter how much money you can accumulate, or how high your social status might be, we're all going to die. And you can't take that money, that, your money, is not a currency God accepts. Most people just distract themselves from the idea of death. They don't want to think about it. They keep themselves busy and never think about it. And I take advantage of that during funerals because I know that during a funeral, they are thinking about death. And I don't want to just sit there and talk about how great someone is especially someone I don't know. I'm not going to do that. That's just a lie. I don't know the first thing about that guy. I want to talk about the thing that really matters when you're thinking about death, and that is how to have life through the gospel. If you ever sit and think about death without Christ, it can be terrifying. The idea of non-existence is terrifying. The idea of eternity in hell is even more terrifying. Man in general has a certain fear of death, which we see here, might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. There's a fear of death that's kind of built within us. Christ changes all that. Yeah, we may have moments of unfaithfulness or moments of fear uh, where, where our trust is, uh, maybe for a second, like Satan has put this thought in my mind and I have fears and doubts and whatever else. But if we believe what God says, we have no fear. We've been delivered from the penalty of sin. Now we have everlasting life and our destiny has been forever changed. And so when we're looking at what Jesus has accomplished for us, we see that his death rendered Satan powerless in verse 14 over the believer, over over us, the genuine believer. We see that Jesus' death frees those who trust in him from the penalty of sin, that is death frees us from the fear of judgment and damnation. And then at this point in the passage, the way, the way I diagram this is something like this. So, so, if I'm, so if I'm writing it, 
I'm, I'm quite sure that in my block diagram, I put parentheses, uh, not parentheses, what's this called? Yeah, parentheses, parentheses. I put parentheses around this, this section because it's kind of like a parenthetical, it's kind of like a parenthetical thought to what we're dealing with. What we have here is kind of a, a clarification about salvation here. Salvation is, well, let's read it. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. So we have this clarification about salvation, that salvation is not for angels, it's for man. And that makes total sense. Man, man fell in the garden, man was really offered throughout the Old Testament salvation. The message of the gospel is for mankind. Uh, man can be redeemed. Christ entered human flesh as the perfect sacrifice so that man would be redeemed. And the gospel is not for angels. It's not for angels. The, the good angels don't need the gospel. The evil angels have already cemented themselves in eternity in the place in the rebellion against God. They've already chosen their side. They've chosen Satan. But notice that Jesus gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Now, check this out. Paul writes this. In his letter to the Galatian churches, that's a region. Galatia is a region. It's the general region that Paul visited in his first missionary journey that you could read about in Acts 13 and 14. Churches like Lystra and Derbe and uh, Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium, places like that. Not Antioch of Syria, they're, they're different. You look on a map, it's kind of like an eastern Turkey, okay. modern-day Turkey. Paul writes to, to those churches, they, they, I mean, by the way, the, some of those places wanted to, Lystra, they tried to kill him at Lystra. They stoned him and left him for dead, and, and he went back into the city and whatever. You could read all about it, Acts 13, 14. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. Because you look at this and you say, well, what do you mean? He gives help to the descendant of Abraham. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Jesus actually, uh, in his discourse, with, when in his conversation with some people that, like, they were bad people, they were on the naughty list, okay? And Jesus said, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. If you are really a child of God, if you share the chief characteristic of Abraham, which is what? Faith. Then you are part of, you are like his children here. Now, there have been a lot of Jewish, a lot of famous Jewish people in history dealing with this phrase, descendant of Abraham. Uh, David was a Jew. Solomon Hezekiah, Daniel, David Lee Roth, lights the menorah, you know, so do James Kahn, Kirk Douglas, and the late Dinosaur. You know who's not a Jew? What's that? <laughs> That's not who I was thinking. You know who's not a Jew? O.J. Simpson, right? He's not a Jew. Um, but Abraham, right? Abraham is not a Jew. Abraham's not a Jew. Abraham predates the Jewish people, right? He's the father of many nations, including Israel. So he predates Israelite history. Abraham was, on the other hand, a person. Oh, that bothers me. Hold on. I don't like that little. There we go little line bothers me. Uh, Abraham was a man of faith. He was a person of faith. He was justified by faith before the law ever was. And we who are saved by faith, genuine believers, share that chief characteristic. And in that way, we are said to be children of Abraham. And so these Hebrews are thinking about returning to, to, to the Jewish law and maybe even on the basis of the, the historical importance of, of the Mosaic law, well, Abraham predates that law. The promise predates that law. And we who place our faith in Christ are descendants of Abraham. Salvation is for the descendant of Abraham. It's for a person who lives by faith in the Son of God. It's not for angels. It's not for demons. And so Jesus' suffering renders Satan powerless, and sets believers free. 
Look what else Jesus' suffering does. It perfectly satisfies the wrath of God. Check it out. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. Does that sound familiar? Kind of see the little, little parallel here with, with verse 14. Kind of have that parallel thought in verse 17. Made like his brethren in all things. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, we're going to come back to that word in a second, for the sins of the people. And so Jesus satisfies the wrath of God. In, in this verse, again, we're, we're, we have an identification with, of Jesus with man, and that's something that the Apostle Paul wrote about. Uh, it's, a, it's a verse that you should relatively know to be able to quote at some level, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he, form, he, was, uh, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So Jesus, even though he was divine, even though he didn't have to reach out for, for godhood, something he already possessed, he humbled himself and took on flesh. So we see that idea of Jesus' incarnation already in Paul's letter to the Philippians. It was necessary, again, even though we looked at this in verse 14, it was necessary that Jesus be made like his brethren in all things. It was necessary for him to take on human flesh again. That doesn't mean Jesus was sinful like us. It's clear, uh, and we'll see this in a, in a minute, that Jesus, and Hebrews says this, that Jesus is without sin. That's clear. We'll look at that. But his identification with man makes him... So, we have... His entering into human, he was made like his brethren, that is, entering in human flesh. And what do we have here? One of, those, one of those clauses again. One of those parts of a sentence that it's like purpose, result. Purpose, result. I always got it right, so I'm, I'm going to keep saying it that way. Purpose, result. We have a purpose or result clause here. He did this so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And so he's a merciful and faithful high priest. He's merciful, that is, he withholds judgment from those who uh, deserve it. He's faithful, and he's called a high priest over and over and over again in Hebrews, and we'll spend chapters talking about that. He was faithful unto death, even death on the cross. He did what was necessary for salvation, difficult as it was. And we see that idea. We see some of these ideas repeated over in chapter 4. For we do not have an high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Does it say infirmities, Tom? Does it say infirmities who does not sympathize with our infirmities? I think it says. All right, we do not have an high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things like as we are, yet without sin. That's the, the first idea that we saw here in, this, in, in the verse we just looked at. Therefore, let us draw near. Because of that, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy. You saw that word? And grace to help in time of need. And so we have this faithful, this merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God. And in that role, he... made propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, this word right here shows up only two times in the New Testament. It's similar to that same, the words propitiation shows up in 1 John 2, 2. It's a different Greek word, but it's the same general idea as what John talks about in 1 John 2, 2. And the idea is this. Jesus' death perfectly satisfies the wrath of God. God has a holy and righteous wrath against our sin. We sin against him every day. 
in his justice, he demands a just penalty for sin. Jesus' death satisfies his wrath against our sin and satisfies God's demand for a just penalty against sin. Jesus' death is an offering that pays the penalty for our sins and clears our debt. So that's the idea that's here. So he, he came into human flesh, becoming a faithful, merciful, faithful high priest, and in that role, what he accomplished for us is that he perfectly satisfied the wrath of God. And therefore, with all this being true, with, with this with Jesus' death rendering Satan powerless, Jesus' death setting us free from fear of death and from judgment, and from Satan's power. Jesus' death perfectly satisfying the wrath of God. Therefore, he is able to help us to overcome sin and temptation. And that's the idea we see in verse 18. It's kind of like a... Well, you see, four... For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, and that's everything we've been talking about. So all these ideas, verse four, sorry. So all these ideas from, we're going to imagine verse 14 coming up here, and verse 15 coming up here, and verse 17 coming up here, all being, sorry, all being summed up in this. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, because of this, He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus understands what it's like to be tempted, yet without sin. He successfully underwent the temptation of the cross. In fact, his suffering was the source of his temptation. That was the source of his temptation because as he's being tested through that suffering... He, he's being temp, tempted, tested, tested by, tempted by Satan, tested by God, the Father, whatever, to not go through that suffering. And yet in his prayer, his great prayer, and I think it's John 17, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Thus, he is perfectly qualified to help to come to the aid of those who are tempted. When we're facing temptation, Jesus can help. When we fail, Jesus displays mercy and can help us recommit to him. Now, that doesn't mean we have an excuse to live in sin. That doesn't mean, hey, look, you know, Jesus is merciful and faithful, and he's able to come to our aid, so that means, you know, and I I could live however I want, and, you know, Jesus is going to, hey, man, free grace. It's awesome. I could do whatever. It's easier to ask for permission than forgiveness. Wait, forgiveness and permission. So I might as well go out and sin, so that grace may abound. Do we have any scripture that comes to mind? Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Hey, the more you sin, the more grace God shows. It's awesome, man. But keep sinning. Keep getting grace. Is that how we should live? May it never be. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? In fact, sin is so repugnant to God that we're told to separate from it. And even we are told passages like this one, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he is, and then a whole list of things. Listen to what Paul wrote to, uh, actually, let's get back to this text. So we have this merciful and faithful high priest who does give grace and mercy But it's not a whole pass to live any way you want. It's help that he's offering 
when you're tempted so that you don't give in to that temptation and live in sin and unrighteousness and that Satan would have power over you and over your life. So don't mistake what, what's being said here. We see the severity of sin and yet as evil as sin is, as damaging as sin is, as dominating as sin can be, we have help. The believer has supernatural help from God. The genuine believer does not have to remain and doesn't remain in unrepentant sin because he has help. And God is able, Jesus is able to change us and to transform us. The genuine believer doesn't remain in a life that is dominated up here in verse 14. by the one who was rendered powerless. We have help from Jesus. We have help from God, supernatural help. Jesus is able to help the genuine believer overcome temptation and it doesn't matter what sin you're dealing with, it doesn't matter how bad the sin is, Jesus can help. He is able to help in time of need. He's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Now, when I talk about the gospel, I like to make it abundantly clear that the gospel is a message about eternity. That's clear. The prosperity gospel twists that. They make the gospel all about here and now. But the gospel is a message about eternity. Salvation is a message about eternity. And yet, it has ramifications for the here and now. That is, Jesus changes us here. And now he makes us like him, not perfectly. And he does that because he helps us. And as we yield to him, he transforms us into a new creature. And so when I look at something like this, and I see this whole idea of, look what Jesus' death provides for us. He he renders powerless Satan. He has no authority over your life. Well, if he does have authority over your life, And if you continue to yield to be a servant of Satan, oh man, there's implications there about where you stand with God. Have I really placed my faith in Christ? Because man, Satan really has a whole lot of power over my life. Maybe I'm not really a Christian. When I see that Jesus' death sets us free from fear of death, who... Uh, those who are subject to slavery, and I see a person who's enslaved. Man. Here, the slavery was through fear. But when he's enslaved, to say, man, she's enslaved to Satan. When I see... that Jesus helps us who are tempted. This is how it works. I get tempted. Anyone here get tempted? You never get tempted? I get tempted. And I fail sometimes. Right? I get angry or I get impatient. Or something like that. And I commit in my life that, listen, I don't want to be, I don't want impatience to be the, a dominating force in my life. I think about that. Or I think about like, hey, did I waste some time? How much time am I going to look back in eternity and be like, man, I'm gonna have, I'm, I fear the amount of regret that I'm going to have in my life. So I'm not saying you have to be perfect. But what I am saying is a genuine believer has help such that he does not submit to Satan and remain in a life dominated by Satan and Satan's works. If that's you, you're not a genuine believer. 
Does that make sense? You hear what I'm going with that? Jesus provides a glorious help by giving believers confidence that we have been restored to a relationship with God the Father and that we should therefore never turn away from him. And for the Hebrews, it didn't matter how bad the persecution was or the consequences were for uh, suffering for Christ. They had help to keep them from falling away back to that Jewish system. In today's passage, I mean, listen, the paragraph is from verses 10 through verse 18, but in today's part of that paragraph, we see how Jesus' suffering relates to us. We see what Jesus' death provides for us. Jesus' suffering renders Satan powerless over the believer. I say the believer, not us, because we may not all be believers. I don't know who is and who isn't. God knows. Jesus' suffering renders Satan powerless over the believer. Jesus' suffering sets believers free from the penalty of sin and fear of death. Jesus' suffering perfectly satisfies the wrath of God against our sin, and therefore he is able to overcome, to help us overcome sin and temptation. He is able. What a glorious high priest and savior we have. May we never turn away from him. May we never be tempted to walk away. May we never return to our old, our own vomit and our old ways. Which is an idea, we're going to see, we're going to see that idea over and over in Hebrews. May we never forsake the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way, our great high priest, for something less, something different. For those of you who have never given your life to Christ, I want you to understand the point that Hebrews has been making throughout, which is Jesus is better. And he has accomplished salvation on your behalf. It's a free gift for you to accept. By faith, you place your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross and nothing else, and you're saved. I'm not going to trust my works anymore. I'm going to place my faith in Christ, and as a result of my salvation, not in order to get saved, because I've placed my faith in Christ, because he saved me, now I'm going to take up my cross and follow him in a legitimate Christian walk where I know I've been set free, where I know Satan no longer has authority over me, where I know I have help to overcome sin and temptation. For those of you who already committed your life to him, who are already genuinely saved, I have a slightly different message, and that is this. You need to remain faithful to your great high priest. You need to remain faithful to your great high priest, knowing that what his suffering and death accomplished and continues to accomplish for you. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. Just you, me, and God. No one looking around. This is a private time. You're here in this room, and you're not sure you're saved. You're not sure you're going to heaven when you die. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you privately. I don't know I'm going to heaven. If I die today, I don't really know if I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to, I'd like to know. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'll pray for you privately. Anyone? I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. No one looking around. It's you, me, and God. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. You're in this room, and you're confident in your salvation. But God has been convicting you about some stuff. And listen, that's part of how God helps us. It is through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. God has been convicting you about some stuff in your life, and you want to repent today. You want to give that over to him. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you. I don't need to know the issue that's between you and the Lord. I see that hand. I see that hand. God is, God is convicting me today about something that's in my life. I see that hand. And I want to repent today about it. I see it. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And I pray for anyone in this room who isn't sure of their salvation. And I pray that you would help them to hear and understand and know your gospel over and over and over again until they they turn and place their faith in you and be saved. 
I pray that you would work your truth. all over their lives until they get saved from the penalty of their sin. I pray for these whom you've convicted. And, and we know that no one is perfect, but that you, your son provides help that he provides grace to help in time of need. And I pray for these, these brothers and sisters who, whom you've convicted, whom you've spoken to by means of the convicting work of your spirit. And you know what the issue is. You know the heart issue. You know whether it's an external or an internal issue. You know all of it. And I pray that you would empower these believers in these areas of struggle. That you and your spirit would put your, your word in their hearts over and over and over again so that they might not sin against thee. That you would and as much as this can happen, remove temptation from them or place them in situations where they're away from temptation until they're strong enough to, to handle the fiery darts of the evil one in those areas. I pray that you would harden their hearts against the sin that Satan so wants them to succumb to. and that you would encourage and uplift them in your truth. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 324. 324. Uh, this will be our closing hymn.